Welcome to Straight to the Point. I'm Tyler Perron, and I'm joined with Dr. Paul Lawrence, the former Undersecretary of Benefits at the Veterans Administration. And we're going to get straight to the point on an issue that is really affecting every veteran at some point. We're going to talk about benefits poaching or pension poaching. And I was not familiar with the term, but it's a term out there and it means something and it causes a lot of problems for a lot of families. Paul, what is that? It's great to be with you, Tyra. Let me explain and then we can decompose it. So pension poaching is the pension poaching is the slang for pay for profit agents who show up to help people with their benefits, often under situations of duress. So the classic example, and this is why it's called is think about the demographics of the time period, an elderly male veteran passes and his female spouse is left to deal with this 80 years old doesn't quite understand benefits, probably is unaware that the husband, the veteran was receiving benefits. And now there's all these questions and all these issues. And all of a sudden they turn to somebody say, who can help? And they say, you ought to talk to so-and-so. So-and-so shows up and says, yes, and I will do it for money. And then they sign up for this and they get services and help, perhaps good services and help, that they could get for no cost from, as we've talked about before, veteran service officers, whether from the American Legion and those type folks or from their state. So in some states, this is actually illegal, or if they show up, they are forced to say, you could get this for no cost. But in many states, it's not. And it's even more sinful to think about how do they find these for-profit agents? Because if you ever had somebody in a on a home like that, a nursing home or independent living, or one of the most trusted agents is the leadership of those homes. And they might be the people actually recommending their friends who will charge money. Probably. Yeah, who will charge money for this. So some of the best practices at the state level, the state DMVs, they actually assign their service agents to the nursing facilities and they go there regularly so they are better known. But that's the situation that happens. And it's really unfortunate because they pay for stuff they shouldn't. Generally, their income is not that great. And so it's real serious. And sometimes they don't get great service. So that's the pension poaching aspect of it. And why it's important is you can unravel it a couple different ways. First is the the elderly spouse in this case should be aware of the no cost options. So there's an information problem and some states take care of that. But in addition, what, what I found before was the the spouse often does not know, in this case, the husband is receiving benefits from VA. And so they find out about it and say, oh, that's interesting. I didn't know he was getting this check. So there's a lack of awareness. And as a result, when they have to deal with the VA for the first time under tremendous stress, a deaf longtime partner has left them and it's complicated and it's hard. It just couldn't be any worse. So there's that situation. Then they're confronted with the following question, which is, gee, am I going to get the same payment my husband was getting? And the answer is generally no. So let me give you an example. Assume a veteran husband with a wife is 100% service connected. I looked this up this morning. He would be receiving $3,500 a month. I rounded down. So without That's a payments. lot of money. A lot of money. So their income would be $42,000 a year. Okay. So that would be what they'd be living on if they had no other sources of income, whatever. So now the veteran husband passes, the wife would be eligible to receive, assuming he died of a service-connected disability, but let's not get into the details. The wife could receive what's called DIC, dependency indemnity compensation. So same sort of situation, the, the, the surviving spouse, no dependents, no whatever, would get $1,700 a month. So you could see Two thousand dollars. Big delta between those two. Big delta. So now you got incredibly complicated process during tremendous stress, and you find out it's significantly less. So again, you go through the situation here: lack of awareness by the spouse that the husband was receiving benefits, lack of awareness because they didn't think about this problem before they encounter it of uh, the change in the funds, which could have been planned for through income support or income, what's the term of look, replacement. They could have bought insurance. They could have done a whole bunch of things. So it really, it really unravels into a very difficult situation all the way around. So the takeaway, we can continue the conversation is really 
letting family members know if you are engaged with the VA, healthcare benefits wise and the like, and what that means. So you're not having discovery moments in these really difficult periods of time. So when the VA gets noticed that a veteran has passed, what happens? Well, that's actually an interesting situation. So ideally, the family members should tell the VA that somebody has passed because there was a big, always a big push to keep them aware of your life situation. So obviously, a birth would increase your benefits. A family member increases. But, but when there's a death or a divorce, the number of dependents you have goes down. So if they don't say anything and VA eventually discovers it through automation and whatever, there could actually be a debt incurred. So in this example, if the vet, if the, the spouse had not said anything and VA was unaware, they'd be receiving $3,500 a month. They would say, but wait a minute, the spouse is, the, the husband, the veteran has passed. You've received an overpayment and we have to collect that back. So imagine now finding out still dealing with the, the stress of a death, still dealing with all the paperwork. And now you say, well, six months have gone by. Oh yeah, we figured this out. You owe us $12,000, the $2,000 Delta. You're like super swell. Now it's even a worse situation. So now you're it's getting just, nothing for a year. Exactly. And it's all bad because they were dealing with limited income and now there's a debt and it's got to be dealt with. So it really causes a lot of difficult situations. And so that's why this awareness of what it's going to take to avoid these situations. There's nothing worse than, there was nothing worse in the last job to having to deal with an overpayment. Now, there's ways you can petition to have it waived and whatever, but still the, inev the shock of getting this notice that you owe this kind of serious money really can be just painful. Especially when you're dealing with the loss of your loved one. You may not have even known how that money was coming in. You thought it was a pension. You thought it was a retirement. You don't know. It's just a government check that comes in that he's entitled to. And you figure they're still paying me. It's right. still good. No, that's exactly right. And kind of something for your listeners to think about is you might say, okay, well, this isn't really me and whatever, but maybe there is a uncle in your family in the, who was the veteran. Maybe you have a family friend who's father or mother are in these homes or whatever, or elderly, this is the kind of situation that we can at least be aware of and just say, hey, are you aware of what will happen when somebody passes and how their benefits could be affected? And are you prepared? Do you have income replacement if this doesn't continue? And then of course, if you go back to the original part of our conversation, just the bad actors showing up. And I know it's all legal in most places, but it's gosh, oh gosh, oh gee, come on. I remember my mother is still with us, but my father passed 20 years ago and people just showed out of the woodwork locking on elderly people. It was disconnected with him being a veteran, but there were just people offering to help for money. And my mother was, fortunately I caught her, but just a good old person say, well, of course I love help dealing with these difficult situations. You're like, well, time out, mom. They are not altruistic here. Cut. What is there? There is some motivation. And if you're not dealing with a nonprofit or a VSO or one yeah. of these state agencies that are there to help you, if they're yeah. coming in, they're a private entity or knock on wood lawyers. I got to have them. But at the same time, there's some great lawyers and there's the ambulance chasers. And there's a lot of people that are offering a lot of services and it used to not be available to represent you for claims and all that. So are they putting in for like pensions? What are they doing? Oh yeah. So the reason pension? why it's called pension poaching is often I made reference to DIC. Another mm -hmm. benefit is the survivor pension, which could be more applicable based on the situation. So that's what they do. They offer to come in and help. And sometimes they say, we'll take a percentage of the pension. So it's not a great deal of money. So now if 10, 20, 30% of it's taken off the top and then it's just too late. They have a contract. It's too late. And that's kind of the situation. And what's even making these things complicated is the benefits possibilities expand, right? So let's say the husband veteran in this situation had filed for an increase or had an interaction with VA going on. The survivor can now continue that interaction. Or if the husband, the veteran had an appeal going on, the survivor can now continue the appeal, right? So there's just more paperwork and more complications and more things to be dealt with 
which makes the help look more attractive if you don't know there are other alternatives. So they're going in and offering to help in return for a cut of not just the past due, but basically in perpetuity, like forever, of, yeah, 20% and we'll help you out. It's more than you were getting, which was nothing or whatever it was. So that sounds like a great deal, unless you realize that, yeah, you can get it. So what should veterans do to prepare for their spouses, whether it's husband or wife, and you're getting benefits? What would you have them do to prepare in case of their, whether it's a young death, old death, doesn't matter. What happened? What did they do? Well, certainly, look, we all know this, right? Nobody wants to deal with the inevitability. Nobody likes to do estate planning. Nobody likes to think about that. But at a minimum, have the conversation about you realize some of this income comes from the VA and they will be there to help if you understand this. And there are these changes that will take place from disability compensation to DIC or pension based on the situation. Of course, I gave you a very simple example with a husband and wife, no kids, no dependents, whatever, but you can imagine kids in different situations. And even you can even have dependent parents under certain situations. So it can get incredibly complex. So you should be aware of that. You should be aware of the likely changes. And these things are tedious to find, but they are, you can find them. Okay. And then of course, planning for well, what would happen if this income wasn't here? Nobody likes to think about buying life insurance, but it's a pretty good investment because of these kind of situations. So, and there's pretty good, there's pretty good life insurance policies available for veterans, whether through the VA or through the private sector. So really it's planning, but as we all know, nobody likes to do this, no one. So it's not <laughs> like whatever. And it's just, I guess what I would say is think about the situation I've described. It's hypothetical, but it's not unrealistic. It's selfish to dump that on the surviving spouse and leave them so unprepared. And that's probably what in this example, happily married, care, love, all that kind of stuff. They wouldn't be doing that normally. It's just one of those things you don't want to have happen in this situation. And you certainly don't want them to be stressed and worried and and destitute after you leave. So make those planning assumptions and, and do the things and at least communicate Uh, Some people develop whole books and estate planning, but at the very minimum, let the folks know that, hey, you're going to have to report that I'm no longer here because things are going to change and how to do that, whether that's call the VA uh, 1-800 number or get on the website or talk to your VSO or a veteran service organization or the state agency. Do it quickly. Don't time. uh, Bad news doesn't get better with time. Uh, especially as those accruals of money that they were supposed to be getting are no longer getting. So that sounds like some great advice. We've been talking with Dr. Paul Lawrence. He was the former undersecretary for benefits at the Veterans Administration. And now he helps veterans sort of figure out what the big picture is and some very specific advice on some of the details from the, the issues and complex problems that veterans have that we just sometimes don't think about because you've seen it from all the different levels. Paul, thanks so much for sharing your time with us. Thanks, Tyler. Thanks for what you do.